In this view of the town, the drop-in is on the right, and the sun is in front of us because the American flag street lamp shadow is coming towards us. But then when the angle flips and we're close to the street light, but the drop-in is on our left, the American flag street lamp on our right has a shadow that is also casting towards us, even though it should be going in the opposite direction. Which means they shot these reverse angle shots at different times of day, not realizing CinemaSins exists and is going to check your shadow angle, bitches. Yes, this is day one of when the monsters arrive, but a vague title card will always earn a sin. Also, making me read information I could have inferred from the movie itself. Callbacks! Roger, I gotta, uh... Look, Halpert, lack of planning on your part does not constitute an emergency on Roger's part, you dick. Pay for your groceries! The director said I'm gonna have my own character eat an apple in this scene so everyone will know how dead I am. Not leashing your pets, or even really taking much care of them at all. This movie is insinuating that the entire town heads to the baseball field for this game. I mean, there are probably a couple hundred people here. I live most of my life in a small town like this, and you know how many people showed up for Little League games? 23. An average of one parent per player and about four total visiting relatives. And then the one creepy guy in town who was creepy solely because no one knew why he went to all the Little League games. These assholes standing in front of the bleachers. There are a million better places to stand that don't make the bottom two rows stare your asses the whole game. Not that you have terrible asses, but I'm here to see the balls. Look, if you like oranges so much that you'll bring them to a baseball game, cut them with a field knife on a surface as unclean as a baseball bleacher rail, that's f***ed up. Why would you ever do this? Hey, I didn't say die. I've never seen a more obvious Chekhov's ASL lesson in my entire movie-going life. Granted, it's the only Chekhov's ASL lesson I've ever seen, but that doesn't make it any less obvious. Context clues from the rest of the scene indicate that these are the outfielders. Are you telling me that they would play this far in for 12 and 13 year old hitters? I know this isn't the Little League World Series, but you basically got all nine players on the infield. You're turning a fly out into an inside the park home run, coach. <coughs> when disaster is coming, your pets will know before you do, cliche. I have a pug that snort barks right before every MCU action scene, so I'm sure this one is based in science, but it's still a cliche. What's this guy starting this new clap about when the movie has clearly shown us everyone was done clapping? I'd keep an eye on Harold and Martha here. I'm guessing they're some of the death angels in disguise, happy that the invasion has finally arrived. This section in silence giving us the deaf daughter's perspective is awesome. Introducing a new satellite campus, the Quiet Place 2 School of Driving in Reverse Away from Things. <laughs> the drop-in ends up being plot important in this panic citizen's f***ing drop-in during an alien attack. <laughs> Religious persecution. Also, praying out loud at a time like this when the Bible says God can hear your silent prayers. Did the insanity outside the drop-in stop? Why would this creature that is super sensitive to sound be stopping to listen closely when we know there are car alarms, sirens, and screaming people running around outside? Better question, how would this creature even be able to listen like this in the direct aftermath of the initial invasion? It'd be at least a few days of easy targets before this kind of nuanced field work, right? Jurassic theft. Why is it still chasing these two when there were a couple dozen people inside that tavern? Does the creature know that these are the leads of the movie? I bet he's an office fan. The creature definitely feels like an office fan. Screw you if you wanted to know how they escaped this though, am I right? She tells her two teenagers to wait here and then walks into the mysterious barn fire with her newborn baby in tow. She should have given the baby to the son and kept the f***ing gun. And even though mom told both kids to stay here, one of them immediately goes back inside. Listen, let's just be real for a second. How much of this family's turmoil is caused by either bad parenting or incorrigible kids? Callbacks! Also, they still haven't removed that nail. Okay, maybe that makes noise and brings the baddies, but at least put a f***ing foam ball over it or a grapefruit. Somehow address this massive injury risk. And I don't think it would make any noise to move this claw off the steps, goddamn. Okay, flooded waters are notorious for dangerous bacteria and you are carrying a tiny baby. Aw, she has a special manger just for drowning. Well, this kid has no future in electronics repair. As they walk away from the farm together, I'm left wondering, what the hell just happened? We cut from day one to day 474, where she's leading them into the barn. She goes underwater, girl goes up on a silo to chart fires, mom finds a canister, and now we're on a pilgrimage? What is going on? Enough focusing on the nasty feet already. We get it. They have to walk quietly, but for the love of potophobes, this movie has more dirty foot shots in it than all the Quentin Tarantino movies combined. Why would you keep walking in the crunchy leaf center of this trail instead of moving over to the grass-doesn't-make-much-noise-at-all side edge of the trail? Run! <laughs> Why? Running is almost always going to be noisier, and silence is your only ally. Even if a creature heard the cans, they still have to locate you, and running only gives them more of a chance to zone in on the commotion. Any injury or pain from here on out is just blunt force trauma. I'm not sure exactly how old Marcus is here, but he's at least been living for over a year where noise equals death and no matter how much my foot hurts, I can comprehend that I still shouldn't scream years old. If this doesn't bring the aliens immediately, then I suggest there are no aliens around and you can go back to whispering and sh How do you just run through an abandoned metals factory on short notice without making noise? You made a noise going through a hole in the fence a few minutes ago. 
Guilt trips. Also, didn't Emmett see the baby already through his gun sight? Why is the movie acting like this is a big reveal when he already Tommy peeped the baby a while back? Also, also, thank God we were introduced to Emmett in the flashback opening. Makes all the difference here. She recognizes him. Did he calibrate the oxygen timer for four humans who just sprinted here? Seems like some complex math would be involved for this timer shtick to be of any use whatsoever. It's three feet of concrete. Must be right above us to here. Which they could be, right? Aren't they intelligent enough to continue to scout out places where they've heard noises? My pug found a single raisin in the backyard once, and it's still the very first place he goes every time I let him out. How is there enough scotch tape to keep these drawings affixed to the concrete column? Have you ever tried to use scotch tape on concrete? This is the biggest sin of the whole f***ing movie. Jesus. I realize you want some light in here, but aren't you kind of overdoing it and wasting some candles? The people that are left, what they've become, you don't know, do you? But how do you know? I think the movie wants to set up some good old-fashioned lawless apocalyptic tribe cliche for later, but doesn't want to put in the work to establish it in the movie itself. He tells her that her dad wasn't ever going to be able to make the radio work, and she says, You're nothing like him! And I'm confused, because Stude was not claiming to be like her father. I feel like it would be easier to script a good reason for her to go off and be mad about her dead dad, but here we are. I want you gone tomorrow. What a dick. What an absolute dick. I'm not sure how this is a comfortable sleeping position, but whatever. <laughs> I hate to be the botanic asshole here, but it's actually both. Oh, and I lied about hating to be the botanic asshole thing. I kind of enjoy it. Also, why isn't it an actual message instead of something you have to decode? It's not like the aliens can speak English and would find the island. I found it in my handy dandy radio station book that was conveniently one of the only things I brought. Here's a silent argument via sign language between a deaf character and her hearing brother. These movies have done a ton for deaf representation in film. Okay, I realize the older sister feels like she has sort of a Book of Eli quest kind of thing to fulfill, but she is deaf. In a world where killer aliens only attack based on sound, a deaf teen alone with a shotgun is looking at hours, not days, in terms of pure survival. Maybe I believe that this many high-heeled wearing folks were waiting at this podunk station when all this went down, even though it appeared to be a weekend afternoon. But I will never believe that any of them left their phones behind. That's where the crossy road lives. See, opening a door that caused a noise, and she didn't hear it and doesn't know it. This is so much dangerous! But also, did she have to go into the train? Couldn't she have just walked around that sh As she walks through this train, I'm stuck with the thought that this could be a video game. One that helps teach folks what it's like to be deaf. And it could be tweaked to speak to the blind as well. Hmm, I can't send a movie for these video game thoughts. So I guess I'll just... Ah, f*** it, send the movie anyway. But also, this deaf daughter character deserves to be the main character in a Quiet Place video game if that ever happened. She's excellent. The sin here is because there isn't already a video game featuring her. <laughs> jump scare crows. <laughs> Another jump scare? Two in less than a minute? See, at this point, you're just the movie who cried jump scares. You're gonna end up training me not to believe the tension, and then when you really want to scare me, I'll be like, sorry, movie, guess the wolf is just gonna eat all the sheep because I'm out of scare f Look, I appreciate the idea that a sound frequency bothers the aliens, and the fact that it's the deaf girl's cochlear implant providing the feedback, chef's kiss. But this amp that she literally cut the power cord off of is doing nothing to amplify this sh She's carrying around this fucking practice amp for no reason, because science says, with no exceptions, this amp needs power to actually amplify anything. And don't you give me any battery nonsense, we never see any batteries. This is a pretty glaring plot convenience hole, so I'm gonna double up the sins on this bitch. Great, Killian Murphy killed the thing just before it killed the girl. But how did he shoot the thing without any shrapnel hitting the girl who was directly behind the target? The fact that this movie has the balls to continue to have entirely silent, plot-important arguments gives me joy as a deaf person. Here, the deaf character is patient and teaching the hearing character how to enunciate so she can read his lips. Yeah, yeah, it frustrates the haters when our real opinions infiltrate our sins videos right alongside our usual obvious nitpicking, but guess what? I do not care! So let's remove a sin here for the representation and then add 20 sins for the dickheads who want to tell me how to do my videos. We're gonna find out here in a second that he just stepped out to find a boat, but you couldn't leave a note? What? Couldn't find any paper or writing utensils in an abandoned office? Also, are we supposed to believe he truly left her? What in this movie has given us any indication that we should feel worried in this moment? So she's alone with a newborn and a laid up wounded teenager, so she is headed out to do... What, exactly? She implies she's after medicine for her son, but this still feels like a stupid decision. This is a conversation that probably should have and would have happened before she left, but I guess the movie really wanted us to know what an idiot Marcus is. F 
f***ing Marcus. Once again, why walk on the naturally more loud than grass wheel sections of this gravel road instead of the grass is awesome because it's quiet and there's lots of it here center? And welcome to the dumbest part of the movie. Seriously, this kid has been shown as completely terrified this entire movie, but he chooses the moment his mom is out on errands and he's in charge of the baby to go out with Marcus Polo and do some exploring? We've been given zero motivation for this. There's dumb and then there's dumb and against character. This child is such a disappointment. He said he found a boat, so now that we're here, why didn't he just say he found a harbor or a plethora of boats? This cross-cutting between Marcus's meaningless moronic meandering, Mom's medicine mining, and Millicent and Murphy's methodical mulling of motorboat marina moorings goes on for all the some time. Also, because one of these things is completely pointless, the tension fizzles every time we cut to it. Hint, it's f***ing Marcus. He seems super worried an alien might be on this boat, but that doesn't make any sense. This boat wouldn't have made any noise to attract the alien. There might have been humans aboard it that it heard and then ate, but why would it stay here after that? Okay, but noose is loosened, right? It's just a slipknot that, in hangings, is held tight by the weight of the body. Why can't he just take it off immediately? Also, kids. I guess they were like, we need the kid to get attacked by aliens, how can we do that? I know, he goes exploring on his wounded leg, leaving the baby alone, he gets jump scared by a really dead body! Brilliant! Yep, because he was hurrying and lazy, he forgot to use the lock-blocking frock of a towel dangle, and he's now trapped inside. Eh, let's be honest. It's not like this kid's dominant trait is intelligence. This is how you raise a gun if what's important is how badass and dramatic you look while doing it. It's not how you raise a gun to shoot when what's important is time and saving your children's lives. Ah, just like stealing air from a baby. How did she know exactly where that thing would go and stand once it got up here? Oxygen tanks did not explode. Oxygen can feed fire, but is non-combustible. Unless she was lugging around propane tanks for her baby to breathe, in which case, probably still a sip. I see the quiet place aliens have the same weakness as the aliens from science. Just once I want to see a movie where the aliens are allergic to mustard or soap. <laughs> you think I'm gonna believe this girl pulled this man's body out of the water on her own without making a sound the nearby alien can hear? <laughs> It's so adorable. Once they knew they couldn't swim. Jesus, they can't see, they can't swim. This is the lamest alien takeover plot of all time. To get help? No. They give in. Here, take this. It'll mean nothing to you, but the drama of the moment will be so cool. I'm not sure which is the more ridiculous possibility, that the creature just happened to float over to this island after them, or that the creature was intelligent enough to navigate the boat. I'm gonna pretend that it was an intentional navigation, if for no other reason than imagining one of these creatures in a little captain's hat trying to work the radio. What is with the American tradition of putting your kids in a closet when any unknown disaster appears? I have to get back to my family. That's it. You drag Jamon Honsu out of bed to play a guy whose purpose is to chauffeur them to the radio station and then get chumped by his own insecurity? The hell, movie? This has to stop! He is one of our finest actors! Not a bit player or a henchman? Hmm, only two black characters of importance in this film, and both help the white people get to safety and then die. And that's... it's not kosher, but I'm not trying to pick a fight with white people here, either. The point is, it's worth a college course dissecting it, and I'd be happy to guess lecture. Is it legal to imitate another movie this directly? I feel like someone should write this movie a Jurassic Parking ticket. TWICE! Look, I'm a simple man. If I see an open candle flame right next to a spraying water mist, I'm gonna wonder how the candle stays lit, and then I'm gonna sin it. <laughs> Movies never slid open one of these sliding glass receptionist windows in its life if it thinks it could be done quietly. Now she's gonna climb in there? Why not throw a stick or something first to distract it? As she slams her cochlear implant into the microphone to freak out the alien, I finally realize exactly how duped I have been. This is the same movie. Fuck, flip, shit, derp. Goddamn f***ing bastard sh fucking suck it off. Right, she's gonna one-shot brain it with a piece of pipe. Did she roll a 20 on her gotta finish this movie so the audience will be forced to believe this check? 